All right, I think this is our crowd. So, hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I know there's lots of stuff to do here and lots of programs to see, and so thanks for choosing to be here. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I'm Michael Burnett, I'm AF7KB, and I'm the author of a series of comprehensive licensed training programs called the Fast Track Books, as well as some supporting workbooks and others, and I'm also the narrator of our audio programs. Now, if you are a uh, grizzled veteran of the HF bands, that's Marconi, and your ham shack walls are already like papered with QSL cards and DX awards, you're probably in the wrong room. You're welcome to stay, honestly, but it's probably not going to be anything really new for you here. For the rest of you, my plan is to spend about the next 49.62 minutes going over some practical basics about getting started in the HF side of amateur radio. Start, we'll talk about building your first HF station, and we'll touch on some HF modes and operating procedures as well. So, let's start with building an HF station. Some of the choices that are ahead of you. I, I think it's safe to say that there are no two amateur radio stations that are exactly alike. Every one of them is unique and created in response to a number of factors, like the ham's operating goals, the operating site, which is really critical, and the ham's budget, also critical. Sometimes they're also the product of what I'd call ham lore. Now, ham lore is that misinformation that you find all over those fountains of wisdom known as Facebook and YouTube and similar things. Some quick basics. When we talk about HF, we're talking about the high frequency bands, those below the six meter band. Primarily those are the 160 through 10 meter bands. There are a couple of more bands that are way down there below 160 meters, but for the moment those are primarily experimental and you won't find them on commercial HF transceivers, not even in the HF bands. And yes, I do know that I should speak of the 160 meter band as being medium frequency or MF, but in casual ham speak, all those bands are the HF bands. Now the HF bands are the worldwide communication bands. They propagate over long distances, we hope, mostly with the help of the ionosphere. The condition of the ionosphere varies with the condition of the sun. For us, the best indicator of the condition of the sun is the presence or absence of sunspots. Those things. More sunspots generally equals better propagation. Sunspots vary in their frequency on a 22-year cycle, with peaks every 11 years, we hope. You've probably heard we have been for some time in one of the valleys of the sunspot cycle. And you may have even heard that the HF bands are dead. Bet you have. Well, first, some good news. No matter what you may have heard, the HF bands are not dead. They smell a little funny. But they're not dead. It's true that we're in the bottom, or maybe just past the bottom, of the sunspot cycle, and it's also true that HF propagation is certainly not what it will be when the sunspots start appearing in greater numbers. However, there haven't been many days at my station, which is, by the way, absolutely not anything special, when I couldn't make some kind of contacts somehow. So far as I know, the ARRL continues to send out those DX Century Club awards and those Worked All States awards. Now, propagation conditions have been, at least for a while, will continue to be challenging. I won't say the bands are alive and well, but they are alive. It just takes a little more persistence to get things done. 
And I did a whole presentation on propagation yesterday, and one of the key points I made is, read that propagation prediction, this deal, right? Well, it's looked about like that or worse for most of the last know, 10 or 11 years. And yet, DXCC worked all states and all that. So that forecast, that prediction, which is a neat little creation by a guy named Paul Herman, tells you about the climate of the ionosphere, okay? And we're good at predicting climate. Climate is, we've got a pretty good handle on that science. But predicting the propagation from your house to Indonesia is like predicting the weather. And weather is different from climate, and predicting the propagation from your house to Indonesia is different from predicting the overall condition of the ionosphere. So that's why it takes some persistence to make those contacts. Here's a recent propagation forecast. You can see this was not a great day for any kind of propagation above 40 meters. It says right there, 80 to 40, day, fair, night, good, 30 to 20, poor, 17 to 15, poor, 12 to 10, poor, 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 poor. And we've, all, we've been, if you've seen that widget, you've seen that in the last 10 years. And yet, take a look. At the moment I took the picture of that propagation forecast, I switched over to dxmaps.com, which is a fun site, and this is the DX that was happening at that very moment on the 20 meter band where supposedly, and by the way, this is during the day, our day, supposedly poor propagation, and yet look at all those contacts going on, and that's just the ones that were, were, uh, were reported to DX Maps. So don't put too much faith in those propagation forecasts. Don't get discouraged. The best propagation forecast is the one you create when you turn on that microphone and go CQ, CQ, CQ. Now, there's plenty of fun to be had on the HF bands. Doesn't take a hundred foot tower festooned with exotic and expensive antennas on it either. It doesn't have to be connected to the world's greatest radio. Getting on the HF bands vastly expands your ham radio world if you've been playing on the VHF UHF bands. It expands it geographically and it expands it operationally. Got a lot more toys to play with. On HF, there's a much wider variety of activities. Now, obviously, there's CW and SSB phone, lots of each. There's also quite a selection of HF digital modes, some of which have become enormously popular, at least for the moment, in response to propagation conditions. You can have interesting conversations with people all over the world, or you can go for awards like Worked All States or DX Century Club, or you can be a county hunter, or I mean, there's, a, there's a million awards you can go for. There are lots of contests of all sorts. If you're a contester, almost every weekend has a, at least one contest going. If you enjoy nets, just chatting with a bunch of folks, there are plenty of those to choose from, from across the HF bands of, of all sorts. Each band tends to kind of take on its own character. That's partly because of how the frequencies are affected by propagation conditions, and partly just by the kind of semi-random assortment of folks who hang out on those bands. So, let me ask you, what is it you want to do on the HF bands? <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah, I get it. Mr. Burnett, um, <clears throat> it's kind of why I came to your little presentation today, was I was trying to figure that out. I get it. It's a big smorgasbord. And the truth is, you're not going to know what you enjoy and what you don't enjoy until you get in there and you try a few of these things. You just cannot tell by looking in from the outside. Uh, 
I, when I first heard about this digital mode called FT8, I mean, you, you heard of FT8? Yeah, okay. I gotta be honest with you. I thought it was the stupidest thing I'd ever heard of. Not just in ham radio, but ever of anything. I mean, really? FT8? Totally not for me. I mean, look at me, I'm a talker, right? It's very limited in the, pe in the messages it can send. It's, it's like a chat program that's really dumb. Okay, it can only send CQ and my call sign and your call sign and a signal report and 7-3. That's it. Dumb. But I write these license courses and I kind of needed to know about this in order to write the license course. So, okay, I get out my old laptop and I download the software and I hook it up to the radio, which was not easy because my radio dates from... Well, let's put it this way, it remembers when John Travolta could dance. <laughs> and I get it hooked up, and I start the software, and I'm on FT8, and two and a half hours later, my wife says, are we going to have dinner, or what? I mean, I just got totally hooked. So, from the outside, it looked dumb. I got in, I started playing with it, it was really fun. So. You don't know. Since you're starting off on your journey, let's think in terms of a station that will let you experiment with a lot of HF modes and find out what lights you up. Let's add to that too that we do this at a reasonably modest level of expense and inconvenience so you're not in over your head before you even get started. And now, do understand, when I say modest expense, I'm not talking about $1.98, okay? Takes a little money to play this game. Well, it doesn't have to be a fortune, but it does take a little money. So by the time you get into this, you can have a lot less into it than these two knuckleheads have into their bicycles and bike gears. That's my son, that's my son-in-law. I know how much that stuff costs. They have the carbon fiber and the fancy sweat thing, band. I don't know what it all is, but you can build a great HF station for a lot less than what those guys have into their bicycling hobby. Let's specify that yours is going to be a station that's capable of operating multiple bands, and since it's well within reach, Let's aim for everything from 80 meters through 10 meters. 160 meters is eh, kind of its own animal, and we'll set that aside for the moment, especially its own animal when it comes to antennas. But mm, you play with that later. 80 through 10 is going to get you a lot of action. Now, we're going to go with modest power. We're going to say 100 watts. QRP operation, low power operation, can be a lot of fun. It's a great aspect of the hobby. It's probably not the best place to start. If you want to get into it later, great. And it, and it can be absolutely amazing. QRO operation, high power operation with a big amplifier is also something you don't need to get into at this point. That can come later when you have your antenna and your operating skills put together. Look, you take a big old amplifier, and there are some great ones, you stick it on a bad antenna, nothing great is going to happen. So you're going to learn about antennas as you go, and you're going to learn your operating procedures. Then if you want to crank up the power to 1500 watts, good for you, go for it. Now we'll talk more about transceivers, but with these specifications, just about any mainstream, all-mode, all-band HF transceiver in, made in the last two decades is going to do the job just fine for you. So let's start with what can be the most physically challenging item, and that is your HF antenna. You ask any experienced HF operator, they will tell you that antenna is the single most important piece of equipment in your station. 
to some extent, your choice of HF antenna is going to be inevitably dictated by the space available to install it and other issues related to that space, like your HOA if you have one. If you have a few acres of land with some very tall trees, no neighbors around for miles, no homeowners association to deal with, and an unlimited budget, well, you have a lot more possibilities than someone on a tight budget in a rented apartment with no land and a landlord who is rabidly anti-antenna. If you have the space, whoops, if you have the space and some tall trees or something else tall to hang on a, uh, to hang a long wire antenna, that's how I'd suggest you go. You can buy commercial versions of all kinds of popular designs of long wire antennas. And if you're even a little bit handy, they're simple enough to construct. Now, I won't say they are effortless to put up, but they are not a major construction project. Okay, you're not going to be having a conversation about how much nine yards of concrete costs to have delivered into the giant hole you dug in the ground to mount your huge tower. It's a matter of hanging a couple of pieces of wire off a couple of pieces of rope thing that's well off of the ground. Long wires strung on trees are very stealthy, too. You have to really look to see a long wire antenna strung up in the air. Little hint for you, those of you who might be dealing with neighborhood issues. Um, there are three basic configurations for long wire antennas. There are flat tops, slopers, and inverted Vs. So the flat topper looks like a lot of the pictures you saw in your license manuals. A more or less horizontal wire in this one, the feed point's in the center, but that could also be at either end, or even at a place somewhere between the center and the end, and each of those designs changes your impedance and your loading and all those things. So a copy of the League's antenna book is a wonderful thing to have when you jump into this. If you don't want the antenna book, which is about this thick, they also have uh, specialty books just on long wire antennas. Okay. This, again, these are pretty simple to construct. Um, here's a, a sloper. This runs from a lower spot to a higher spot. Usually that works out to be from the eaves of your house up to some tall object like a tree. Now again, this can be center-fed or off-center-fed. I suspect that most of them are end-fed just because of the physical layout of things. It's sort of a problem that it solves. Inverted Vs run from a lower spot to a higher spot and then back down to a lower spot. There are, now these are good if you're sh you know, short horizontally, so you string out lots of wire and make a long wire by, by just raising the middle, basically. Um, there are a few multiband long wire designs that you can choose from, right? There are uh, N-fed designs, there are off-center fed designs, there are trapped designs, all kinds of, of designs out there. One popular one that covers a lot of bands is called the G5RV. Now you can buy these ready-made from the suppliers. This one happens to be uh, made by MFJ. Or you can make one yourself with some wire, that's that part, and some ladder line, or it's also known as window line, that's this part, and with a choke ballon, that's this part here. That's important. That helps match it to your transceiver. Uh, really not a hard thing to construct. Now, when you go to put it up, it does need a tuner to operate properly. It's about 102 feet long. Now remember, you can put it in an inverted V or as a sloper, and you don't have to have a lot that's 102 feet long in order to make this work. It can be a flat top or sloper or inverted V. The center needs to be at least 35 feet above the ground. 
That is not much. You think about an 80 meter straight half wave dipole, it's got to be up 130 feet to really work well. G5 RV only needs to be up about 35, so that can be a lot less challenging than 132. The lowest points need to be at least 25 feet above the ground. So if you make that inverted V, you can have the 35 feet here or more, and at least 25. Now, higher is almost always better with antennas. That's just as close to an ironclad rule as anything in ham radio. Height is might. So higher is gooder. Um, as you get it higher, by the way, it gets a lot easier to tune. If you have a big chunk, a big chunk of land with several tall objects around it, you have to have several near the perimeter, you might consider a horizontal loop antenna. You'll need three or four or more, good size, ideally, say, 40 feet tall, um, trees or barn or whatever other tall things you have on your property that are spaced a healthy distance apart. So it ends up looking something like this. I have a friend who put one of these up a few years ago. He has the big tower with the nine yards of concrete and the big tribander up on top. And one day put himself up a horizontal loop around his property and he hasn't put a single electron through that Tribander since then. He loves his horizontal loop because it works all the bands and it's a tremendous reception antenna. It's a great receive antenna for him. So uh, that can be a great antenna if you have the space. The length of that antenna needs to be one wavelength of the lowest frequency for which you are building it. If you have room to string out 160 meters of wire, you have a an antenna that will work 160 meters through 6 meters. That's about uh, 550 feet of wire, by the way. We're aiming for 80 meters and up for you, so you'll need to string at least 275 feet of wire. Now, a horizontal loop is not terribly picky about its exact shape. It can be square, it can be round, it can be a triangle. It doesn't much care. The idea, though, is to enclose as much space with it as possible. It isn't picky about height, either. Uh, higher is always better, but there are reports of some that are installed as low as 10 or 20 feet up. By all reports, they're working. Now, are there long wire antenna designs that uh, are different from the ones I've described? Sure. but. Given the parameters we've chosen here, is it worth spending days and days researching them? If you're interested in that thing, that kind of thing, maybe. But honestly, you're not going to find anything that's dramatically more efficient or, you know, directive than what we've talked about here. Um, what's important? For you, at this stage, I want you to focus here is get on the air and start learning and experimenting. This isn't going to be your last setup. You've got to face that. This is not going to be the last station you build. You, you can optimize your setup later when you've learned a whole bunch and you know where you want to focus. If you put up, say you decide, you know what, I really dig 40 meters, CW, that's what I love. All right, you don't need that G5 RV anymore. You can put up a much more efficient straight 40 meter half wave dipole and you're going to have a lot more efficient and effective antenna for that band. We're designing so that you can play on all the bands and find out what you like. Um, Optimization. I talked some about yesterday. Look, optimum is not required for ham radio. Optimum is optional. Suboptimum is what most of us have, and suboptimum is just fine if it gets you on the air and you're enjoying yourself. The basics of putting up long wires are really pretty simple. Your objective is simply to safely 
safely. Get a hunker to a wire up in the air as far as you can, separated from the supports by insulators. The ends should be supported by non-conductive material. If you put conductive material up there, even though it's insulated, it still becomes part of the antenna and it throws off your tuning. So you want just some rope hanging this, this thing up. Um, you'll want to rig the ends, or at least one end, on some sort of a system that lets you raise and lower the antenna because you're going to fiddle around with tuning this thing for a while and need to do some trimming. If you're using a tree or two, there are any number of ways to get those support ropes up in the upper reaches of the trees. None of them involves imagining that you can climb trees. You hearing me? None of them require that. You leave that to the cats and to the people who get paid to do that sort of thing. If you're handy with a uh, fishing rod, you can cast a lead weight over a tall branch using fishing line to pull up a stouter rope or some paracord and then use the stouter rope to support the antenna. People have been known to tie a fishing line to the arrow of a bow and arrow and get the job done. It's probably a good time to say safety first. Watch what's on the other side. One of our club members almost killed a cop car one day when we were setting up for field day. Fired our air gun with a weight over it and missed the cop car parked over there by about that far. Look what's on the other side. This is the air-powered gun, by the way. You can see these advertised in the back pages of QST just about every month. And that fires a spherical fishing weight. This is, frankly, a device that should not be nearly as much fun as it is. So there's, there is some fun to putting up antennas. You know, and I want you to, to consider that, too. Look, a lot of the people I, I talk to is... Like, they look at setting up a station as this sort of drudgery that they have to do before they get to the fun stuff of operating. But listen, we're ham radio operators. It, setting up a station can be a lot of fun. So think of it as fun, and then you'll do it, and then you'll get to play on the air. Um, nylon packing twine will work just fine if you're putting up a temporary installation. That's what we use for field day every year. For something more permanent, you will want some Dacron rope that the dealers will happily sell you that's rated for exterior use. Otherwise, you get the surprise of having your antenna fall down. Be sure you hang your antenna so that there is some slack in it. You don't want to pull it tight. The wind is going to blow. Now, a lot of times when I tell people who are new to this about how easy it is to put up a long wire antenna and how very little there really is to it. They give me this look like can't be that simple. It's got to be a trick. But it's not. It really can be that simple. This is our club. We usually put together a field operation every year for 7QP, the Region 7 QSO party. And that's kind of our warm-up for field day, which is coming up. And one of our favorite field antennas is our fan dipole. Now, if you don't know, a fan dipole is, in this case, three dipoles. You take a 40-meter half-wave dipole, and then you have a, uh, what do we have? We have a 20, a 40, and an 80, I think. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it looks like a fan, and they're kind of connected by insulators. And we string that thing up. We hang it off a tree, we hang the other end off of the, uh, the tower that you see here, which is not in its up position yet. That's our tower trailer, by the way. Pretty cool, huh? Um, with some helpers, it usually takes less than an hour and a half to set up the whole thing. Now, honestly, if we had fewer helpers, we could probably do it in an hour. But, you know, people like to play. Now, a little hint, for, by the way, for any of you who are in ham clubs, and if you are not in a ham club, I need to talk to you afterwards because you don't seem to understand that one of the main reasons you got your license was so you could join a ham club. That's my pitch for ham clubs. You can accomplish a huge amount of antenna building in a very short time with a couple of 16-inch pizzas and a cooler full of beverages 
I will leave the selection of beverages up to you. Now, nothing tall around your house, is that your problem, Bunky? I have the same problem. I live in Washington State. You would think I would have some huge tall trees to hang stuff off of, but nope, not in my neighborhood. I'm in the same boat as you. There's nothing even close to high enough to, to make a decent long wire antenna. I do, however, have a decent sized backyard, so we're putting up a vertical. That happens to be a 0543 foot vertical. Now it's possible to home brew a vertical HF antenna, but there is no getting around the fact that they present more difficult engineering problems to solve. And that's both electronic engineering and mechanical engineering, or civil engineering, I guess. They do have to stand up. And uh, to stand up even in stiff winds. By the time you scare up all the various parts you need to assemble a multi-band vertical, in most cases, you're probably going to save money, time, and frustration by just ordering one of the commercial antennas. HF verticals are just about universally quarter-wave vertical antennas with loading coils. A true half-wave 80-meter vertical would be 132 feet tall. That's a lot of aluminum to convince to stand up, even with guy wires. Quarter-wave antennas are a lot more practical. But because they're quarter-wave antennas, they typically require some sort of counterpoise or ground radials in order to work. This particular one, this 43 foot 05, um, takes ground radials all around the base and his basic recommendation is the more the better. That's typical with radials. So that's basically a 43 foot tall aluminum whip with ground radials all around the base. Now this is a high gain DX88, it's 25 feet tall, so shorter, it covers 80 through 10 meters, that 43 footer covers 160 through 10 meters. Now, I just had a chance to see one of these in action and to compare it on several bands with a dipole and a tribander Yagi uh, that was up on a big tower. Gotta tell you, this one was a little bit noisier, uh, but it was at times outperforming the other antennas. It was neck and neck. And this was a field operation, so the radials for this, we just stretched out some wire on the lawn around it. In your backyard, you can just stretch out those wires and tack them down with turf staples, okay? You don't have to bury all your radials. I've heard people say, I don't know how I'm gonna bury all these radials. Just tack them down with turf staples and the lawn will grow up around them. If you wanna be real technical, mow your lawn short before you do this, but you don't even really have to do that. Um, you, yeah, so just turf staples. Here is a radial plate. You'll need one of these for the base of your vertical that goes down at the base and that's where you connect all those radial wires. I own one of these, in fact, I think that one's mine. And uh, the guy who makes them sells them on eBay. He's a machinist. That DX88 that we were using was a ground-mounted antenna. Other HF verticals you can put up on the roof. And there are, uh, there are some that, that they don't need radials. From what I hear, they even, even those work better if you stretch out some radials, and you can just stretch them out across your roof. This is a Cushcraft R9. Um, the scuttlebutt is this one still needs radials, even though you can see, huh, it looks an awful lot like radials, doesn't it? That brings us to the topic of stealth antennas. There are still plenty of zoning ordinances and homeowners association regulations out there that forbid or drastically limit what sorts of antennas, if any, we can put on our property. However, there is still hope. There are lots and lots of ideas on the web for stealth antennas. Some of them are good. Here are a few of the more common solutions. Now, by the way, far be it from me to suggest that you act in some underhanded or deceptive way in order to skirt these very important regulations. So 
consider this next part just for entertainment purposes. Most towns and HOAs don't forbid flagpoles. That would be downright patriotic, right? Look very closely at this handsome 30-foot flagpole here, and you may notice some suspicious bulges. I don't know for sure, but those could be loading coils and traps. That's Zero Five's 30-foot flagpole antenna. Now, if you can't get away with that, you're not really trying with your HOA. So that's one way to go. It's a dandy little antenna, too. If you have some long lengths of plastic rain gutter around your place, you can sneak an end-fed half-wave wire antenna into the gutters, even if it has to turn a corner or two. It'll still work. If you have aluminum gutters, <laughs> well, I happen to know for a fact that not too far from my home, it's not my house, but not too far away, there is a set of aluminum gutters that is radiating just great right down to 40 meters almost every night. It takes a little ingenuity, and it probably takes some testing, but it absolutely can be done. Tell me that isn't stealth. I've seen that work. Now, say you live in a high-rise apartment or a condo. If there's a balcony, you can stick a ham stick. You can get those from any of the dealers. They're one-band antennas. Or you can get a screwdriver antenna that's an adjustable HF antenna. You adjust the length on that deal, basically, of the loading coil. And uh, you stick that out on your balcony. You need a counterpoise? Look, some wire fell off of the balcony and strung down there, which you pull back up when you're done operating. If you have a high enough balcony, you don't even need the hamstick or the stealth antenna. You just feed the wire out over the balcony. We had a, a club member, bless his heart, we just, just lost him. He was a character. He, he traveled all over the world. And he had his uh, Elecraft KXE and his little bitty Elecraft CW key, and, and he carried the amplifier too, and a roll of wire wherever he was. <laughs> out the window, and he worked the world. He also set the hotel on fire one night, but that's another story. He swore he had no idea what had happened. Now, do you have a big attic? You can stick a long wire up there. You might have to double it back a couple of times. Okay, now it's a folded dipole. It's not going to be optimum, but it can work so long as everything is wood up there. If you have a metal roof, you're out of luck on an attic antenna. If you go the attic antenna route, Please remember, your antenna is carrying some very high voltage. Even at 100 watts, the ends of that antenna have very high voltage. So observe proper precautions. The League publishes a whole book of stealth antennas. Well worth the investment if it saves your house from burning down, wouldn't you say? Or there's the magnetic loop antenna. This one's from Alpha Antennas, who are here at the show. There are others. There's Pretty easy to build for yourself right up to the moment that you try to find that which is a high voltage variable capacitor of the correct size. Those are really rare. That's, that's the hang up with building it. Other than that, it's just two pieces of coax. The, uh, the little loop there is what carries the signal from the transceiver and that induces the signal in the big loop. This one will go down to 80 meters, by the way, because it has the extra loop there. Um, they're not the most efficient antennas in the world, but they do work. They get used on de-expeditions all the time. That's just almost standard issue for the de-expeditions. Magnetic loops will work effectively just 36 inches off the ground, too. You can mount one on a tripod, stick it out on your patio, and operate worldwide without the HOA ever catching on. And besides, they wouldn't have any case anyway, because that's not a permanent installation. 
You can pull pretty much the same trick with a buddy pole, which is what we often operate off of. We stick it on our patio and away we go. Haven't got that vertical mounted yet. Um, you can pull, well, yeah, uh, this one, whoops. Yeah, one more possibility. And this one is if you have none of the possibilities I've mentioned so far, and that is remote operation. If you have internet access and a couple of pieces of the right equipment and or software, you can operate a rig remotely, such as a club rig. A friend of mine has been a ham since 1951. 1951. That's the year I was born. He was already a ham. He recently moved into a living situation where there's simply no room for any sort of antenna. Huh? No problem. He became a member of a club that has a remote controllable station and he operates that way. Now, I'm not going to go into all the intricacies of setting up a remote control system because there are a lot of ways to skin that particular cat. My apologies to cat owners. Obviously, the radio being controlled has to have computer control capability. One system works directly from your computer by running some software, like the Ham Radio Deluxe remote control server. You end up with that operating from a screen that looks like this. That's the screen of your computer, and you can see it's laid out basically to imitate a radio, okay? And to operate any rig you want that's hooked up to the system with that. Um, there's a company now, I can't remember their name, but it's something like Remote Radio Incorporated or Remote Ham or something. Uh, they, they will sell you a membership in their club and you can then operate any of their super stations, big amplifiers, big tower, big antenna, that are located all around the country. It's not inexpensive, okay? I wouldn't tell you it's, it's pocket change. And it's around a thousand bucks a year, and you get access to all their equipment. So there's really nothing stopping you from getting on HF. All right, now we're going to go radio shopping. But before we do, let's talk briefly about your feed line. Now, what I'm about to say borders on ham lore heresy, so shield your delicate ears if you're going to collapse or something, but here we go. It is perfectly possible to have a working feed line made of that RG6 75 ohm coax cable that you can buy at Lowe's or Home Depot for about 30 bucks for a 100 foot roll. It will work. Michael, that means I'm going to have an automatic 1.5 to 1 SWR. I know. So what? 1.5 to 1 SWR translates to 0 0.18 dB of loss. That means about 4% of your power. If the rest of your antenna system is well matched to 75 ohms, which will take some work and some more expense, you're probably going to get more signal to your antenna than half the HF operators at this convention. However, by the time you buy some conduit in which to install that non-variable stuff, and you buy the connectors, and you buy the matching gear that you're going to need at the antenna end and probably at the transmitter end, you're going to be into the deal at least 70 or 80, 90, 100 bucks. Our friends over at DX Engineering, disclaimer, they gave me a hat on the way over here. So I'm corrupted. <laughs> They will happily make you a 100-foot length of their 400 max low-loss double-shielded coax complete with professionally installed PL259s on either end. And folks, installing those connectors is where things can go horribly awry. So getting those professionally installed until you develop that expertise is a really good idea. 
$119.99 with free shipping. So for 20 bucks more than you were going to waste on a really crummy setup, you can have the deluxe stuff. Don't sabotage your station by shortcutting your feed line. It's really important. If you, by the way, remember to order some waterproofing goo for your connectors, which you do want, and you order it at the same time as your conduit, you'll even get free shipping on that. Now, I imagine that Gigaparts and HRO and MFJ will all just as cheerfully make you similar deals on similar products. If you have a shorter run than 100 feet, good for you. You got it handled for even less. Now, there is the small matter of how to get their feed line into your ham shack. And this can be quite a challenge. Now, of course, you can go with the time-honored drill a hole in the wall and feed the thing through. Some people are hesitant about that. Um, some folks don't feel comfortable drilling and sawing and all that stuff on their home for some reason. So for them, here's one clever solution. This happens to come from MFJ. This is a panel, it's a connector panel, and this is the outside of it. The inside is a mirror of this. It has a bunch of connectors. It even has a ground connector for your ground to pass through. This comes mounted on a handsome cedar board. You measure your window, whichever way your window goes. You saw that board to the correct length. It even has weather strip that comes with it. You put the board in the window, you shut the window, you're done. You have now built a pass-through for your feed line into your house. Really, it's a less than an hour project. And if you're renting or you just don't want to make holes in your house, well, when you're done, unscrew your cables and away you go. Now, this one sells for about 70 bucks. Count the $5 connectors on there. And remember that there are connectors on the other side. And I don't know how much that one costs, but then, you know, you need a nice, handsome aluminum panel. You're not going to be able to build that for 70 bucks. It's very slick. Now, hey, hey, let's go radio shopping, the sexy part. Modern HF radios are certainly amazing things. Here's one now. That's the ICOM IC7851. Is that not dazzling? Is that not beautiful? It's handsome. It's a beautiful piece of technology. It does amazing things, and it costs about $12,500, unless you catch it on sale. Look at the knobs and buttons. I counted them. There are 97, I think. I may have lost track somewhere along the way. 97 knobs and buttons. You don't need that. You don't want that. That's a Steinway, and you need to learn to play chopsticks. Let me gently remind you that as wonderful as that thing is, many years ago, hams all over the world were communicating with each other just fine with radios like the venerable Collins KWM2. It's a handsome thing. That's a radio with a total of 10 knobs and switches, including the on-off switch and the three position, three count them three, meter function switch. I'm not advising you to run out to the swap meet and find a KWM2 for your shack, but I am pointing you toward the knowledge that you honestly don't need every single modern doodad contraption and whatchamacallit on your radio, no matter what those wonderful folks over in the exhibit hall tell you. They'll probably try to skin me, so this may be my last presentation, but you don't need all their toys in order to make your shack work. You want something like this. This is the Alinko DXSR8T. List price about, whoops, $479.95. Brand spanking new, in a box. It has a tuning knob, a volume knob, squelch, RIT, and even IF shift and it covers 160 through 10 meters. We just had one operating at our 7QP, and that thing chugged right along. It did its job. 
it, in fact, it kept going when one of our expensive radios pooped out about halfway through the afternoon. For roughly another 150 bucks, you can step up to Yezu's FT891. That's a snazzy little radio. All, this covers 160 through 6 meters if you decide to play on the Magic Band. It's a very compact radio. Okay, this, this, this thing's, that's about the size of a car radio. Because of that, you have to operate it through the menu system. Um, some people adapt to the Yezu system right away. It's very intuitive for them. I'm one of them. I have a little Yezu handheld. I picked it up. I took a look at the instructions, and I can operate it. Other people, my friend John, are in a war with the Yezu operating system, and he just can't have a Yezu radio. He sold two of them. Um, so you got to put your hands on the thing and see how you like operating through that menu system. Very versatile. Video and uh, real, real quality. If your preference runs to ICOM, they offer the ICOM IC718. This is miraculously enough almost exactly the same price as that Yezu radio, uh, about $600. If you are up for a little bit of risk, there's always the used market for ham radios. <laughs> this actually belonged to a friend of mine. And that note on there explains things like tuning uh, or uh, frequency indicator is five kilohertz off, uh, reach five kilohertz low, and you need to wait for this to warm up before you do this and stuff like that. Okay, so the, the, they're going to have their little fidgets and crotchets. They're not going to be uh, straightforward as brand new radio outside out of the box, but. 250 bucks, and I can tell you a secret, he just sold it for 200 at our last swap meet. Um, I would advise you to stay away from eBay. I have heard way too many horror stories about eBay transactions that went south. Try and see the radio in person. If you're in a place that's big enough, Craigslist can be a source. Of course, there's the swap meet out here. Uh, you want to at least see the thing light up and make some noise on the receive side. And it's even better if you can take a dummy load along and plug it in and see it, you know, with a watt meter actually make some watts. Okay, that way you know you're buying a radio and not a project. The last major item that'll probably be on your list, depending on the antenna choice that you make, is an antenna tuner. That's the MFJ949E, which MFJ claims is the most popular tuner in the world. It has lots of range, plenty of power handling capacity, 300 watts, and a new one will set you back about 200 bucks. For about 50 bucks less, there's the um, MFJ Travel Tuner is what everybody calls this. Now, the real name is the Mobile Tuner, but if you ask them for a Travel Tuner, they'll know exactly what you mean. That one is also rated at 300 watts maximum. Okay, so now you have your antenna, your feed line, your radio, maybe a power supply, that would be a good thing, and maybe even a tuner. Let's play radio. What are we gonna do? Don't know. Oh, okay. Here's where we get to this menu. Very broadly speaking, there are three families of modes which are used on the HF bands. CW, SSB phone, and digital modes. Now, I don't mean to shortchange any of the other modes, such as AM or slow scan TV or any of the other stuff that's happening there, but those are more specialized than what we're covering here today. Now, we're going to fly over CW pretty quickly, too. I kind of suspect that if somebody is committed enough to learn the Morse code, they're committed enough to HF to where they're probably not in this presentation. Um, I will say, since the code requirement went away, there's more code on the air than there ever was before. Why is that? I think of my old uh, welding instructor. I went and took a welding class one time. I asked him which of all these welders we had that he liked the best. He goes, I like my old arc welder. 
Why do you like your? You kidding? You can buy one of those for two hundred bucks. We got the TIG welder, and they say, ah, I love that arc welder. I can go out and I can fix a plow that's buried in mud with that thing. You can arc weld through mud with a good arc welder. That's CW. You can send your signal through mud with CW. It's really good at getting through bad propagation or static or anything else. And that's why it's popular. But it's a whole other thing to learn the Morse code. Um, you also find a different crowd of people on CW, by the way. There, there are a couple of spots on the phone bands, especially 20 and 40 meters, that they're crowded with a lot of, yeah, let's put it delicately, less than civil conversation. Um, something like this. You won't run across that stuff if you're working CW, but if you're on phone, you can easily avoid that by simply, ha-ha, turning the big knob and moving on to another spot on the dial. Now, SSB phone is probably the most popular mode on HF, and there are lots of different ways to use SSB phone. There are contests, HF nets, DXing, and what I call point and shoot. That's where you just tune around until you find a human being and you try to make a contact with them. I'd suggest a good starting point for you is nets. There are lots and lots of them on all of the bands. I did a quick search the other day for 75 meter nets on the uh, net directory search on the league's website. I turned up 144 nets on 75 meters. Now, when I searched all the bands, I got 420 nets. Some of them are really specialized. There's the Medical Reserve Corps net that only fires up on an as-needed basis. And others are, y'all come. Everybody's welcome, and they're on a very regular schedule. Some of them are even daily. Those 144 that I found, by the way, are all listed as wide coverage nets. When you book look regional or local, you'll find even more. The reason I suggest nets for you is you can look up exactly when they will be on what frequency. And so it saves you a lot of fruitless hunting. Pick a likely looking suspect for you. Tune in and listen. Listen from the start because at the start, any good net is going to explain their procedures for you so you'll know what you're doing. I know the license exams leave the impression with some people that HF operation is wildly different from VHF, UHF operations. You need to speak something like this for HF. Um, there are some differences, and there's some vocabulary to learn, but let me set your mind at ease, okay? Most of it is conducted in plain English. I think you're going to pick up the general idea really quickly. Keep yourself a cheat sheet of the Q codes and the pro signs and all that stuff by your radio. Uh, we publish one. We call it Ham Radio Facts. And there are lots of sources for this stuff. Pay attention to the flow of the net, and you'll be up to speed in very little time. Formal nets provide a structured environment that can be great for a beginner. You know when to talk, you know basically what sort of communication is expected, and you have a sense of the rhythm of the net. I really don't suggest starting right into contesting unless you have a good Elmer by your side. You'll get your skills up to speed quickly enough, and then you can go play that game, but, well, some of the players take the game really, really seriously. And if you're not right on top of the contest exchanges, they get all in a twist. Well, let's face it, some people kind of lose their minds in the heat of competition. Heaven help you if you slow down their pace or fail to log your QSO. So wait until you know what you're doing a little bit better, and then you're going to have more fun at it. Point and shoot is great if you have a little more patience and you don't care so much about the structured environment of a net. 
Your best bet is try to tag on to the end of a conversation. That's what it's called, tagging on. That way you'll have the call signs straight and you'll have them written down. Write down call signs. It's easy enough to tag on. You wait till they're wrapped up and then you say one of their call signs and your call sign. Remember to use those phonetics. It's HF. Sometimes it's really hard to hear. Okay? A lot of us are older. I'm to the point where I can barely work SSB phone because of my ears. I can't, can't quite understand an awful lot of it. It's got to be great reception for me to, to copy it. So use those phonetics and make it easy for folks like me. Um, you tag on to the conversation and hopefully you've been paying attention to what they've been doing. So if it's been this long-winded conversation about the weather and whose daughter is doing what and blah, 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 well, those are rag chewers. And they like long conversations on the radio. So be prepared for something of a social conversation. If it was call sign location uh, 73 and uh, QRZ, who is calling me, that person is working on some kind of an award. And they want to get in and out with your contacts so they can pile up the contacts for their award. Um, another toy in our toy box is the digital modes. And these have gotten very popular recently. Some of them are designed for very specialized purposes. I'm going to touch on two of the most popular, the ones where you're most likely to make contacts. One is more of a chat mode. It's um, like RTTY, like radio teletype, or even like the old AOL instant messenger, if you remember that. It's, it's kind of that format. A more social mode, if you will. The other is wildly efficient and strictly about call sign, signal report, 7-3, and on to the next contact. First, we'll talk about setting up for digital, because it's the same for all the modes. You'll need a computer that's running a reasonably modern operating system. You don't need any sort of high-end gaming computer for this. I'm running my shack off of my old, I got about 800,000 miles on it laptop and I assure you it's CPA is CPU rather is probably made of balsa wood it's not not a real fast machine it's running Windows 7 but it gets the job done just fine you don't need a real fast computer for this the win the computer has to get the audio to and from the transceiver that's how the magic works it's all done with audio Here's how, what I'd call the textbook setup, okay? This is what they teach you in the license manuals. The audio to the computer is coming out of the headphone jack. The audio from the computer is going into the microphone input. It actually doesn't work very well at all. There are some inherent problems with it. First, there's no push-to-talk control anywhere in there, so you either have to manually switch to transmit or you have to do what a lot of people do, which is run in Vox mode, VOX mode, so that when your computer starts talking, it automatically switches on the transmitter. Second, the audio outputs of both devices are at line level. That's around a volt. Microphone inputs are at mic level. That's around a millivolt. One volt, millivolt. We're talking about 30 dB of overload here. So you end up using about a sixteenth of a turn of the volume control to try and get the volume, the, the, the level to work. Um, now, there may be some people working with this textbook setup, but it's not me, and nobody I know has that either. Here's what I'm running, and what most of the people I know are running, more or less not exactly the same equipment. That box that we've put into the middle here is made by a company called Signal Link. They're out in Oregon. And uh, they make a wide assortment of cables that attach to your radio. There's no standard connection, okay? My radio, like I told you, dates from the disco era, and it has um, like MIDI plugs back in the back 
Uh, others have USB, and others have, you know, you have no idea what's back there until you start, tr start trying to hook it up. Uh, so there's no standard, but they make cables that match up with just about any radio. That thing replaces the sound card in your computer, and it matches up the level going to the radio. It also controls the push-to-talk function. Well, now that your computer and radio can communicate with each other, the next step is to get the right software running. The first mode we'll talk about is PSK31. There's free software called FL Digi. FL Digi. I think that's how they say it. That's some free software for that mode. There are some others. Ham Radio Deluxe also does PSK31. Now, if you're not familiar with their product, that's quite the software package. It does your logging. It handles multiple digital modes. It integrates with the WF, uh, WSJT software suites. Uh, and it does a whole lot more. It is not a free program. At the moment, it's $99.99, but they probably have a special going at the, at the show. Um, for the very weak signal modes that are very popular now, at least for the moment, including FT8, it's the WSJT-X suite of programs. That's a free program. You just go on Joe Taylor's website and you download that start with PSK31, the one that's a lot like RTTY or AOL Instant Messenger. It's a keyboard-to-keyboard -keyboard conversation mode. PSK31 means phase shift keying 31 baud. It's very narrow band. Let's say propagation is looking at least fair on the 15 meter band. You'll tune your radio to 21.230 megahertz. Why did you do that? Because it's the unofficial PSK frequency for that band. And you can find all the frequencies for the different bands uh, online or in our fax book, or I mean, they're, they're easily found. You'll set your radio for upper side band. Unlike RTTY, the digital modes, just about universally, I think all of them run on USB. Some won't work any other way. The rest run there by convention. Now, you're probably going to hear a lot of static on the frequency. Don't worry about that. PSK31 is made for fair to poor propagation conditions. You fire up the PSK31 software of your choice. Let's say you opted for Ham Radio Deluxe. You're going to get a screen that looks a lot like this one. Now, FL Digi also looks a lot like this. It just has a lot fewer bells and whistles than the uh, radio, uh, Ham Radio Deluxe. Take a look. There's a bunch of signals down here, all clustered uh, up from 21.230. Since it operates with audio, different audio tones create different offsets from 21.230. So there can be a whole lot of signals crowded in there next to 21.230. Um, I think there's about eight in there. When you click on the waterfall display, your software will start decoding whatever that conversation is that you clicked on, which you see in the window above. Now, one little problem with PSK31, FT8 has gotten very popular because it is so good at dealing with bad propagation, so sometimes PSK is a little like this. Kind of hard to find somebody to talk with. But if you're persistent, you'll, you'll find somebody. But like I say, it's gotten a little less popular. Then we come to the uh, next to latest officially released weak signal mode, and that is the notorious FT8. As a technical achievement, FT8 is amazing. If PSK31 is a weak signal mode for fair to poor propagation, FT8 is the nearly invisible signal mode. It is quite capable of pulling out a signal with signal-to-noise ratio in the single digits. Single digit signal-to-noise ratio. It can pull it out. It is specifically designed for poor propagation conditions using low power through a marginal antenna. You do not need to fire up a big old 12-element Yagi on top of a 100-foot tower with your 1,500-watt 
amplifier to make this work. In fact, it is real bad form to do that. You dial your power down when you're using FT8. First time I ever tried it, I think I told you, it, it, we were running 50 watts on 20 meters into a buddy pole that was set out on our patio, and we only had it up about 10 or 12 feet because the wind was blowing that day. You could tell how hopeful I was about this, this experience. Um, rotten propagation day, Paul Herman's forecast was all for poor. Every band was going to be rotten, and he was right. I fired up the computer, I tuned in 14.074, that's the 20 meter frequency for FT8. I flailed around with the software for a little bit, and you will flail too, but you'll catch on to it. It's not that complicated. And finally I got it working, and I made a contact. Oh yeah. 3.5 miles from my house, but still, it's contact. Then, all of a sudden, I had Wisconsin, Michigan, Belize, and Portugal. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> like I told you, two and a half hours later, Carrie was going, can we have dinner now? Um, so I was pretty hooked. FT8 comes to us from the great guru of weak signal modes, that is Joe Taylor, K1JT, and from Stephen Franke, K9AN. In fact, FT8 stands for Franke Taylor uh, Eight Tone Frequency Shift Keying. Now, your setup for FT8 is exactly the same as you had for PSK31, except you're going to be running the FT8 software or the WSJT X weak signal suite. And again, you can download that from Joe Taylor's site. On the left, this is the FT8 screen. On the left over here, you're seeing everything that's happening on that band in the FT8 world. If you squint, you can see down toward the bottom in the green band, WA6GXQ is calling CQ, right here. If you click on him, I think you double click on him, uh, your computer will go into CQ mode automatically and it will respond to his CQ. If he answers back, and you have your computer set up to auto-sequence, everything goes automatically. All the auto-sequences are over here. Now, this is people you've either tried to contact or who are trying to contact you. So that kind of, and all these, they, they, you'll watch them, they just kind of march upward as you go along. The new stuff comes in at the bottom. Here, here's where you set up your standard messages. So he, he answers back, your computer will give him a signal report, his will give yours a signal report, and it will even, even sign off with a pleasant 7-3. And then you're on to the next contact. Now that's about it for in-depth, intimate conversation on FT8. It's about making contacts, it's not a social medium. It's possible to hack in tiny little messages with this part down here in the lower right hand corner, but I've never seen anybody actually make it work. And besides, it kind of defeats the efficiency of the mode anyway. Now one thing you must do for this mode and most of them uh, that the work on the WSJT suite is get your computer clock accurate. It must be accurate to within a second versus GPS time. There are programs you can install that will automatically update your computer's clock. Windows 10, I presume 11, does a pretty good job of keeping your time accurate, but you can always go on time.is, time.is, to check it out before you start transmitting. This is what time.is looks like. The reason for the accurate time is that FT8 operates with precisely timed 15 second slots of listening and then transmitting. So if you're not synced up, you're going to be transmitting when the person trying to contact you isn't listening. They're going to be transmitting too, vice versa. All right, so there's your whirlwind tour of getting into HF. Now, before we close up, 
I have some people out there I want to talk to. You know who you are. It's the perfectionists in the room. Oh yes, I know you're out there. I have some bad news for you perfectionists, okay? I know you want to go on the HF bands and you want everyone to go, wow, oh, this guy really knows his stuff. You don't, and they're going to know that you don't, and it's okay, all right? You're going to make mistakes. Brace yourself. It's going to happen. The good news is that fully 95.27% of all hams, according to a statistic that I just made up, are very friendly, good-humored, and totally forgiving. And so are you. Especially if they find out that you're new to this aspect of the hobby. I can promise you, you're going to get at least 99% encouragement in what you're doing. So get in there and play. That other 1% or whatever it is, you're not going to make them happy anyway. So forget them, focus on the happy people, and have some fun. They're going to get over their tra traumatic encounter with you, trust me. Remember, this hobby is about fun. So, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good enough. If ever there was a great motto for ham radio, that is it. Get out there, get on the radio, have fun, and do wonderful things. All right, thank you for coming. Thanks for being at Hamvention. Thanks for being in ham radio. And I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions? Show of hands. Yes, sir? Two part. Did I say I'd have a two part? part? The first is a thank you for doing this. You're, well, You're making learning this fun with all your fooling around. We try to make it fun. By the way, let me say before, before I get. A lot of what I just covered is in a little book we have at our booth that's called The Fast Track to Finally Getting on the Air with Ham Radio. So, a lot of nuts and bolts stuff in there. All right, part two. I know, I know. He's asking, why is FT8 so popular? It seems so pointless if you click a button and all this stuff happens. All I can say is try it. Uh, and, okay, part of the reason it's popular is that it's popular. Okay. Oh, you understand? I mean, so there's a critical mass of, of people out there uh, who are using FT8, and so it's easy to make a contact, right? And also it's popular because it bangs through when nothing else will bang through. And remember, we've had some not great propagation. Well, thank you very much. You. You're very welcome. I'm getting, I'm getting the this signal. I'll be at the back of the room if anybody else wants to chat or come by our booth. We're in 1908.